In this talk, I'm going to cover materials that are not often dealt with in discussions of what it takes to get a patent. Applying for a patent and all the work that that entails is the first step in a long process. What I'm going to focus on is what happens one and a half or more years after your patent application is filed, a process called patent prosecution. It is in patent prosecution that you find out how good a job you and your attorney did in preparing the application, and you also encounter the luck of the draw as you find out the prejudices and peculiarities of the person who decides if you get that patent, the patent examiner. One caveat, and some limitations before we start. I'm not an attorney, and I'm not allowed to give legal advice regarding patents. What you'll hear today is my opinion and the facts as I best understand them. We may have some attorneys or agents who are listening who can answer some of the questions I cannot. Also, we are going to cover today only U.S. patents. Foreign patents are a topic that could easily be the subject of another complete talk, perhaps for the future. I liken patent prosecution to a trial. While you're not in a courtroom, all the players are there. You're the defendant, your attorney provides the defense, and the examiner fills the roles of prosecutor, judge, and jury. Because the examiner is so important, it is a good idea to find out as much about the examiner as possible and to establish a good relationship with him or her. Before you involve yourself in this process, you should know why you are doing it. A patent can be a very valuable asset of your business, or it may be totally worthless. Some are fond of quoting statistics that only show that only 5% of patents are commercialized. But as you will see, that's an oversimplification of the situation. Many patents are applied for with no intent to commercialize them at all. When you consider a patent, you should have two main concerns. Patentability, can I get a patent for this invention? And freedom to use, does someone else already have a patent on this invention? A patent is not your only option. If you disclose your invention publicly, no one can patent it. Of course, then you lose the monopoly for a patent that a patent would give you. If you keep the invention as a trade secret, you can save on patent costs, but you have to actively protect your invention from disclosure. Sometimes a copyright can substitute for a patent, as in some cases involving computer software. And a provisional patent can buy you one year to raise funds for a non-provisional application. Preparing your case. Since you are preparing for a trial, you and your attorney should prepare the case as carefully as if you were going to court for any other purpose. Your attorney will, of course, prepare the case, which, this, which in this situation means drafting a patent application. But the application the attorney will draft will be built almost entirely on what you tell him or her. The attorney is an expert in the law and may have some knowledge of the technology on which your invention is based. But you are the invention expert. It's up to you to tell the attorney in your words, or better, in a carefully prepared invention report, what your invention is about, and most importantly, what are its novel inventive features. Finding the novel inventive features. The novel inventive features of a patent are what patent claims are written on and what court, court battles are fought about. I've written a long blog article specifically on what they are. But the purposes of this article, we can simply say that there are those elements of your invention that distinguish that from the invention of others, which is the so-called prior art, and identifying the closest prior art. Prior art is anything that was known in the public domain before your invention was made. It includes patents, articles, object for sale, in any language and in any country. While it is possible that the prior art that invalidates your invention is an obscure article in Tajikistan, it is unlikely that such an article would be found by the patent examiner. Most citations that I've seen in patent office actions in obtaining 35 patents and representing inventors for nine years have been patents, and usually U.S. patents. Sometimes a European patent will be cited, and rarely one from Japan. That's a good re there's a good reason for this. Most inventors from other countries will also file their patent applications in the United States. Working with your attorney. In working with your attorney, it's very important that the most significant features of your invention appear in the claims. Drafting of patent claims is a high art. It's the province of attorneys, and it's not going to be covered here. The wording of the claims is up to your attorney, but the content of the claims is largely up to what you tell him about your invention. There are many strategies attorneys use in writing patent claims. A good attorney will know most of them. You should ask your attorney what strategy will, he will or she will follow. For example, many attorneys write claims very broadly, knowing the patent office will object to the breadth and having the intention of falling back to a more defensible position later. 
it's very important that this core position is what you really want defended. I've seen far too much time, effort, and money expended by inventors and attorneys defending claims that were not really central to the client's business strategy. Another classic mistake is having the attorney write claims that do not protect the most novel features of the invention. Frequently, an attorney or an inventor does not, those who do not know each other well in particular, will write claims which simply describe the invention. Since most inventions are made up of known and unknown parts, such a strategy is often rejected by the patent office as an obvious combination. One strategy to get around such problems is to define an invention by its range of operating parameters. For example, a hammer is a well-known object which cannot be patented. However, if a standard hammer is used under conditions of extreme heat or cold, it may not work. A hammer which will stand up to those conditions could be patented. If something is new, it is considered novel. Whether it's useful is also a pretty straightforward concept. But the idea of obviousness is something quite different. It is this concept about which most patent arguments, including patent examinations and court battles, fought over patent infringements. In patent law, one basically compares an invention to what could be created by someone skilled in the art. That is, the patent office does not just compare your invention to someone else's and ask if they are the same. The test of obviousness is much tougher than that. The obviousness test is based on the straw man, who is someone who is not only skilled in whatever field your invention is about, but also has to hand everything written anywhere else in the world by anyone prior to your invention. That means, in principle, your invention could be ruled obvious due to a publication written in an obscure journal in Uzbekistan. While that is the letter of the law, in practice, the U.S. Patent Office almost always tests your invention against other patents usually U.S. patents, but sometimes foreign ones, particularly European. However, if someone else, such as a competitor, happens to be involved, it is possible that an obscure foreign journal article might surface. I once had a situation where I had to get such an article translated from the Swedish. In our patent search business, we let the client determine the worldwide scope of the search. If we're asked to search used back journals, we will, for a very big extra fee. Your role as an inventor in interaction with your attorney and others who might help you, such as our company a la carte, is to identify those features of your invention which you know are most likely to be unobvious. The easiest way that I've found to, do these, to identify these features takes two steps. Step one, list all the features of the patent, those that are known, such as those that are already part of other inventions, and those that are unknown. List them in one column on the left side of the piece of paper or spreadsheet. In the column on the right side, note if you've ever seen a, a particular feature anywhere else in products or in the literature. Thus, if your invention is a widget, and while you've seen many widgets, every widget you've ever seen or known, heard about was green, then that would be a novel feature. Unsupported claims. If you ever, ever feel like testing your attorney's knowledge, ask him how they would handle a no antecedent basis rejection from the patent office. This rejection is more common than it ought to be which means translated from legalese is that a patent claim is not supported in the body of the patent. The examiner, at least the examiner, could not find the supporting information. Getting a patent is not an overnight activity. From application to issuance usually takes at least three years and often longer. The process can be extended if you file a provisional application, add one year, and by the time spent in each of the patent stages. Office actions take place any time after the application is published, which usually works out to about two years, as shown in the table. What happens if you don't do a patent search? People who decide not to search for prior art are taking a big risk. Their behavior reminds me of the Fram oil filter ad, where the mechanic says, you can pay me now or pay me later. If you don't search, then the patent application that is written on your invention may be easily dismissed by the first office action that occurs when an examiner finds prior art that conflicts with your invention. Not only will you be spending money on necessary legal fees, but it may not be possible to rescue your application. This is true because while patent claims can be adjusted in a prosecution, the body of the patent may not. Doing your own searches. Many inventors seek to save money by doing their own patent searches. But unless they're very familiar with how patents work, those searches may not do them much good. Inventors are usually looking for something that looks or works just like their invention. However, that's not the way the patent system works. Patents are based on claims addressed to novel inventive features. And features from several different patents can be combined into an obviousness combination argument 
by the examiner. Often inventors are stunned by patents that an examiner chooses to cite against them because none of them, none of that prior art looks anything at all like their invention. At a la carte, we think and we search like the patent office. And for that reason, we are more likely to find the kind of prior art the examiner will cite against you. We search patents by patent classes. That's the way the patent office does. You can access the U.S. Patent Office class system for the web, from their website. Also, the World Patent Office uses a completely different class system. You can find the primary world patent class listed on most U.S. patents. A thorough discussion of patent classes and how to use them is well beyond the scope of this talk. Our searching, there are several different ways to search. A fully electronic search, which is cheap but incomplete. A, a manual search, which is slow and expensive. Or a hybrid search, which is what we do, combining electronic and manual searching. Once a patent search is completed, the next step is often to have a patent application drafted by an attorney or agent. We strongly recommend that the inventor prepare an invention report first before contacting the attorney, so as to save costly attorney time in interviews. Sometimes an attorney will ask the inventor to prepare an invention report. At my former job at a Fortune 500 company, it was a requirement that the inventor prepare such a report before contacting the company attorney. The sections of a typical patent are listed. They are also the sections of an invention report. If you want help preparing an invention report, check out our website. I'm only caught up on this section briefly because I want to focus on what happens after your patent application is filed and ready for examination. That examination will start with and focus almost entirely on the claims. It is not the, that the other sections of a patent application are unimportant, but they play mostly a supporting role in patent prosecutions. After about 18 months, your patent application will be published on the U.S. Patent Office website. Shortly thereafter, your attorney will receive the first office action from the U.S. Patent Office. Make sure your attorney knows to inform you as soon as an auction action arrives, as the clock then starts running and you have a limited time to respond, or your patent application will be automatically abandoned. I have 35 patents, and I have never had one that didn't have at least one office action. An additional rejection is pro forma for the Patent Office. The office action will be written in legalese and may be entirely unintelligible to you. Your attorney should explain it to you. Leaving out the boilerplate, some office actions will be a list of rejections of one or more of the patent claims on various grounds. The first thing to find out is, are all my claims rejected or only some of them? This will be very important considering your strategy as to what to do next. The next thing is to find out what patents or other prior art are being cited against you. You should get copies of each one of those documents. Then look carefully at the sections that the patent examiner cites against you. Your attorney should offer an opinion on the rejections, but you're an expert on the technology, not the attorney. Often examiners are miles off in what they cite, but sometimes they find something that's right on the money. Tell your attorney the most significant differences you see between what the examiner cites and what your invention is. Remember here, it's the claims that count. Even if your widget looks completely different from the cited art, if the feature the examiner cites is the same in the, is in the claims, uh, then you have a problem. The prior art consists of everything that was known before your invention. It includes materials that are patented where the patents are in force and materials in the public domain which were, ne which were never patented. You can get a patent on something that's an improvement of someone else's invention, but if that patent is still in force, you may have to pay royalties to the inventor who still owns it. The novel inventive features. It's the patent in the patent prosecution, it's the novel inventive features that are really important. The features that the inventor and the attorney propose in the patent claims are judged by the examiner against the obviousness standard. The examiner will try to prove by citing the prior art that the novel invention features were known or could easily have been deduced by the straw man from the prior art. Here the role of the examiner as both prosecutor and judge causes problems. As at a trial, there are witnesses for both sides. The opposing witnesses are those inventors who have created prior art that is being cited against you. They are represented in proxy by the examiner who will use their work against your invention in several different ways. One tactic that often surprises inventors is the obvious combination. This is where the examiner takes claims from two or more patents and makes the argument that they form an obvious combination which adds up to your patent. 
This is a cla it was a classic legal press.